Well, thank you for the welcome, and it was a, it's a great joy for Jenny and I to be uh, worshipping with you. I bring you greetings from the Burnside City Uniting Church, and although it's a church of about 350 people, uh, you're very important to the church because I'm on a mission to capture as I walk into worship in that church the joy that I always have walking into worship here. Um, when I'm asked to preach, I do often preach from the lectionary because I find uh, very interesting that it, that it always has the passage that I actually wanted to preach on anyway. And although Ian says you, you get to preach on John the Baptist once again, yes, I do. So, <laughs> so that's, that's great. So um, I just want to... to talk about for a little while that the reading that we've just had which is quite interesting because it starts with King Herod. Now this is not Herod the Great who threw all the babies into the, the river at the time of the birth and, and um, uh, Moses was saved. This is Herod the Second or Herod Antipas and we'll uh, get to that in a minute. But uh, Herod the Antipas was in, lived in Tiberias, and this is Tiberias as it is today. Um, and it, it appears that Jesus may never have been to Tiberias, which explains why, uh, despite the fact that he was p fairly well known in the region, why uh, Herod would be guessing that he was someone else. The reason he guessed John the Baptist was almost certainly due to a guilty conscience. He had killed John the Baptist uh, without really due cause. And it's a bit like when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. He probably saw the spirit of John the Baptist behind everything. And so when someone came along who was uh, preaching and influential, he probably thought, here, I'm about to get my just desserts. This is John the Baptist. So that's one of the possible reasons that he immediately thought, ah, this is John the Baptist. The Jews, on the other hand, um, thought this was Elijah because in... Uh, uh, their teaching, Elijah was going to be the forerunner of, um, of, of the, the saviour that they were looking for. But of course they were looking for a military saviour, but Elijah, the great prophet, was going to come back and, and point the way. So when Jesus appeared, they thought this was Elijah. And even today, uh, at the Passover, in the meal, they set an extra place for Elijah and they put a cup of wine in front of the spare chair and at some time during the ceremony they open the door to let Elijah in as the forerunner of uh, the Messiah that's to come. So they naturally thought when someone came up like this that it was Elijah. As for the, the rest of the, the Jews, they see someone, a, a prophet, that's speaking, and they say, look, we haven't had a prophet for 300 years. Uh, this must be uh, the prophet that God sent, possibly Elijah come to lead the way. And it's fairly common, I think, that, that men fit God into their view of the world. So rather than listening to what Jesus was saying, they had this preconceived idea that this must be the prophet that we haven't had for 300 years. And I guess the message, because it's relevant today, is it's not about fitting God into our world, it's about fitting our world into God's world. And, and this is what the Jews were doing. So the three guesses at who Jesus was were all wrong, but they were all uh, highly... Um, explainable uh, according to the, the day. And uh, John was a straightforward, straight-talking character. And uh, he wasn't scared to talk out when he thought uh, wrong was happening. And so he criticised Herod. And that was a confronting thing to do. And he got thrown into prison. And that's the, the prison he got thrown into very isolated place, very confining place. And here was John that walked through the, the desert and, 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 and you know, was sort of famous for... And, and John had his disciples as well and um, 
uh, so on, but was freely roamed the land, he would have found it an enormous punishment uh, to be locked up in this place, and all because he criticised Herod for doing the wrong thing. Now, what did Herod do? Now, this is a tricky bit, and I'm very grateful for... Oh, no, I'll just uh, introduce the two characters I'm going to talk about, um, Herod uh, and Herodias. And what did he do? I'm very grateful to William Barclay for actually draw, drawing this uh, family tree, this diagram, because it's a really interesting one. It starts off with Herod the Great. And Herod the Great got married multiple times during his reign. And the, the funny thing uh, with Herod the Great, so his first wife was Doris, and he had a son, but Herod the Great was a very um, suspicious type of person. And if he thought anyone was threatening his rule, he did away with them. And of course the son uh, was going to do it, so he murdered uh, the first son. Then he got married again to, to marry Abner, and he had a son Alexander and Aristobulus. And uh, Aristobulus was the father of Herodias, is in this story. So unfortunately those two sons met the same fate as the first one and, he, and Herod the Great murdered them as well but they'd had a daughter now he obviously liked the name um, uh, Mariamne because he married another one of them and uh, he had a son Herod Philip now Herod Philip never actually got to be an emperor he was a sort of a, a playboy and uh, he actually married Herodias who was obviously related to him um, and they had a daughter, Salome. You with me? There'll be a test on this later. So Herod the Great got married again to Maltaki and had had, the, had had Herod Antipas, and it's Herod Antipas that we're talking about today. And he seduced his half-brother's wife, Herodias, and married her. And that was the point at which John the Baptist, I don't know why he couldn't have criticised them well before that, but that was the point at which John the Baptist said, this is wrong. And indeed, in Jewish law, it was wrong. Uh, and he, he, he had sinned in many ways. And the interesting thing is, of course, Herodias is actually his niece, uh, but it's also uh, sort of his sister-in-law as well. So it's a strange relationship. Anyway, finally Herod the Great married again, just to complete the story, married Cleopatra of Jerusalem, had Philip the Tetrarch, who married Salome. And Salome was both his niece and his grandniece. So this family was more complex than any reality TV could have, uh, uh, could have thought about. And, and they're the complex relationships that, that, that are behind this story. And, and John the Baptist criticises. He said, you can't do this. And, and um, uh, Herod II, or Herod Antipas, was angry with him. But interestingly enough, he only threw him in prison. He could have killed him then and there. But there's, in the descriptions of, of Herod II, you, you often get the impression that he had an admiration for John, for this you know, straight-talking person, John, uh, and so he didn't want, really want to kill him. He wanted to sort of punish him. But, you know, these uh, emperors had no problem getting rid of uh, people they didn't like. So it's interesting that uh, Herod had not wanted to kill John at all. And then, um, as you know, the next person in the story is Salome, who danced um, at the banquet with Herod with, in, in publicly, if you like. Now even that was very strange because Salome was part of the royal family and the people that danced at, at these sort of events were usually you know, strippers and prostitutes and so on. So to have a member of the royal family do that sort of dancing, and I, I, I went to the internet and I found a picture where she's covered up because this, uh, this was sort of... Um, I didn't want to make it an X-rated sermon. And, and the, the, so Salome did the dance and, 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 and Herod II was so impressed that he made this, and he clearly sort of talked before he thought, and he made this outrageous thing that he'd give her anything. And it was her mum, Herodias, who said, right, I want the head of John the Baptist. But even then, Herod II the, the shows his weakness 
because his weakness was he'd already made this public announcement and he was so scared of um, having the public criticise him that it was easier for him just to, to grant what was wished than to stand up uh, and fight for, for what he really wanted to do and that was to not kill John the Baptist. So John the Baptist gets beheaded because Herod was too weak to stand up to public opinion and yet you get the impression that he really didn't want to kill John the Baptist at all. So isn't it um, today's world, we actually have had, I think, over the last decade or so, a series of politicians in this country who have been looking at the opinion polls to make their decision. And what the country needs is leadership. What a church needs is leadership. And we just are seeing the sort of Herod the Great leadership played out over and over again. And that's what's wrong with, with society today. And, you know, I knew that I'd be preaching uh, the day or two after assembly made a decision on, on the uh, uh, a marriage of, 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 of same-sex marriage. And we do need to um, always get out there in the public with what we believe. Now, I'm not saying that everyone has to support that decision or be against that decision, because it could be quite divisive for the church. It's a complex social issue, and it's a complex theological issue as well, where you're balancing a theology of marriage, if you like, with a theology of how we treat uh, uh, the brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and you know, that balance is critical. But we have to make a decision and we have to have the conviction of that decision and go out publicly for it because that's what John the Baptist did. He tried to decide what was right and wrong and he went out and he advocated for it. And there are many times in society today where the church is getting uh, criticised for standing up for what it believes. Uh, well, we only have to go back to this story to show that one of the great heroes of the church, John the Baptist, uh, was actually beheaded for standing up with he believes, but that's why we remember him 2,000 years later, uh, because we admire people who do that, and the message from this for today is that we must all stand up for what we believe and, and, and be advocates for uh, Christ's kingdom on earth by uh, standing up to society and not being so worried about what the public opinion will do when we do that. It wasn't meant to be easy. But you see, we do waver. And this poem by uh, G. G. Studdard Kennedy, who was a, a, an army chaplain who wrote poetry, I, I only put it in because I remember way back to um, religious instruction classes in, in, in secondary school where uh, the teacher quoted this poem and the last few lines shows the way we as human beings sort of often uh, attack the world. There's something that drags me upwards and there's something that drags me down and the consequence is I wobble twixt muck and a golden crown. We have the ability to embrace the kingdom of heaven or we have the ability to embrace um, the world of man with all its faults, and yet we, we, we oscillate between the two. And uh, the John the Baptist story says, look, go for the golden crown. It's not going to be easy, but, but it, it's what to do. And I, I guess when, when you're thinking about these things, it, it's amazing how often that last four verses of that uh, poem has come back to me in that time. And I just give an example of, of um, where scientists, for example, have had to stand up against um, the social conscience of the time. And I went to a conference a few uh, uh, weeks ago, actually. It was a, a Christian conference, and I was asked to speak about one of the topics that I'd studied over the years and written about, and that's end of life and euthanasia. 
Every, and the ethics of that. Everyone else was talking about the ethics of sex, of transgender and so on. And I was actually speaking uh, immediately after lunch. So I got up and said, well, I'll make two observations. First, I've got the post-lunch nap spot. And the second is everyone else is talking about sex and I'm talking about death. So I didn't really think that was particularly fair. But one of the uh, ministers that were there that couldn't stay for the conference wanted me to buy this book uh, cleverly titled When uh, Harry Became Sally and it's a book about the transgender movement particularly in the United States and uh, so I bought it for him because the author was there and I got him to sign the book and so on and um, and as you do when you buy a book for someone else, I had a bit of a read of it before I gave it to him, you see. And, and I'm not, you know, I've got no uh, background in this field, but it was very interesting. It makes the point that I wanted to make about science, that the transgender movement has been fighting its battle rightly ab about being accepted on the basis of sort of social justice and non-discrimination. But it's also, um, pushing it, if you like, in some areas too far to try and get things redefined in its favour in the public conscience. And it's certainly got the backing of the public, but one of the points they make is how language can be used to push an agenda beyond just the, the social justice thing. So in the United States, they're beginning to have laws in states which redefine things. So instead of talking about on your birth certificate what sex you are at birth, which has always referred to your biological sex, this movement is pushing to have gender assigned at birth, although we all have the choice of what to do and biological sex doesn't matter. And the scientists, that, that uh, the scientific position that's being defended in this book is, well, Somebody's got to stand up to this because biological sex actually is important. It, it was there for a reason. So we can't just have a choice and assign it at birth and that's, that's what's got to now take precedence over what your biology is. I mean, there are, there are a small percentage that, that are indeterminate, but basically uh, you've got to start off with what we know and then uh, and gender, unlike sex, gender is a social construct, but it can't actually override uh, a biological construct, but that's what they're trying to, to do. And, and this book is really trying to say, look, whether you think that social justice is fine, everyone does really, but uh, let's not push it too far. And language is actually very important in that thing. So gender assigned at birth gets you over um, the, the concern about you know, being born with a certain chromosome determined biological sex. And then there's the other one that, that they talk about. They said, well, it, there's a great deal of sympathy, particularly in children, which they're particularly concerned about, if children sort of uh, say, I'm a girl trapped in a boy's body. And everyone says, well, that's, um, you know, that's very sad. It's called gender dysphoria and it's, it's very sad. But the fact is that because you're not happy with your body doesn't mean you're a girl trapped in a boy's body because if you've never biologically been a girl and you've never psychologically be, been a girl, how do you know what you are trapped in, in a body that you don't like very much? Or is there another reason you don't like your body very much and we ought to find that out rather than putting you on hormones and trying to change you? So they're just saying, where's the scientific evidence that your view alone is enough to uh, set off a medical course of events. Why don't we look psychologically into what, probably, you know, were you bullied by the boys so went and played with the girls and identified with them and is there a problem there that needs to be sorted out rather than immediately gender reassigning? So the whole book is sort of saying let's start from science and then look at the social constructs around it. If we want to achieve this equality position, let's not change all, all our definitions at all. And even uh, the, the, the words gender reassignment surgery are not scientifically correct. You're not reassigning anything. You're just making one sex look like another one. Um, and so uh, the scientists, by writing this book, will be heavily and are being heavily criticised by a social movement that's gathering sympathy on the basis of social justice 
And whereas there's no argument with the social justice, there's arguments about how far you push it. And the scientists are saying, hey, we've got to push back on this because we, this could be going too far and actually putting people at risk. Just an example, it was one that just came up because of that. And I just uh, use that example uh, to say that when you have um, a, a body of knowledge, or in the case of, of the religion you em embrace, you have an understanding of what God wants for you, then like John the Baptist, um, you've got to be straightforward and honest and stand up even when society is going the other way. And so that, that's the, the message from this passage. And John the Baptist should be a sort of a hero for standing up even to death. So it is a wonderful story from a soap opera point of view, but it's also a wonderful, inspiring story of how the church is going to survive another 2,000 years if all of us that are convinced that we can establish the kingdom of heaven on earth or help establish the kingdom of heaven on earth stand up against the things in society we don't agree with and, and uh, are advocates for the, the position that we believe that Christ would have us take. And we should always be prayerful that we're guided in that way uh, as we go forward. So it's, it's delightful to have spoken to you this morning and, and that, that's the message for the day. Thanks, Ian. A lot to think about in that. As we think about that...